this is me and this is my talk flutter versus zombies so um i'll walk you through step by step and we'll have some demos we have a few other things um hopefully i'm coming through okay i'm gonna carry on so uh the talk what are we what we're we gonna keep in this talk um so this is the this is the agenda and I'm, and i've got a very limited amount of time so i'm gonna try and race through this and hopefully hopefully i keep all of you sort of engaged um so first of all what are we talking about uh, rendering 3D in Flutter. So like the last talk was talking about 3D, that was talking about using the packages. We're going to be talking about how those packages work essentially. Um, and also specifically how you might create 3D games in Flutter and then recreating games, in this case, recreating Resident Evil 1 from the PlayStation, the original PlayStation game. So Resident Evil on the PlayStation 1. So this game really holds like kind of a special place for me uh it sounds a bit ridiculous but like 3d the for my first real experience of 3d was the playstation and when i remember i remember playing the game specifically going how are they getting these really good graphics now <laughs> we look at the graphics now and it looks terrible however back then these were these were absolutely brilliant graphics right like you couldn't get any better uh, you had some arcade things, but you know, like it was really good. So it was one of those games where like not many, not very often did you get a game that felt like a cinematic like adventure. And it also kind of sort of captured the, a new genre, which was, you know, um, uh, action horror or adventure horror, if you will, the idea of getting scared. So um, we're going to take we're going to take on a little journey here um, and see how we might go and take what the original game was and do it in Flutter. So half of half of this kind of problem taking some some other uh, system and using that and 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 using the the essentially I'm not using any of the original code I'm not using any of that stuff that would be wrong. Um, I'm recreating it from scratch. And to recreate something from scratch, you need to understand the original hardware. Now, we're not building an emulator, right? We are recreating the experience in Flutter. So a little bit of information about this sort of diagram you see in front of you. Um, the CPU on the original PlayStation is a 32-bit MIPS RISC, uh, MIPS-1 RISC, RISC processor. Um, that means it can, it can run, and it also it runs a whopping... Uh, 34 megahertz. Uh, I mean, you know, that that's that was hugely impressive at the time, but uh, you know, compared to the day standard, it's nothing. Which in theory should mean that we can get all of the performance of the original PlayStation on quite a few modern devices, including desktop, probably web, and most definitely mobile. Um the actual processor had 32 general purpose registers and only two multiplication and division registers. Okay. Uh, and it had two megabytes of system RAM and one megabyte of video RAM. The two things are separated. We'll talk about a bit more in a bit. And some of the key points about like understanding how to approach this is also talking about the fact that you know things like on in the PlayStation, the CD-ROM is a two-speed CD-ROM drive, and as you can see here, with an eight-bit bus, a byte at a time down the bus, it could reach a maximum three hundred kilobytes a second. I mean. I'll be honest with you, that's nothing, right? Like, you know, it also kind of is interesting then because if you need to load data, you need to have your data arranged in such a way that you can load it in chunks quite reasonably quickly. And a lot of games took advantage of ordering their data on the disk so that they could access it quicker, including Resident Evil 1 to a certain degree. So our, our point here is we're going to concentrate on these three points. That is the Geometry Transformation Engine, that's the GTE, Motion Decoder, and Sony's GPU. So the Motion Decoder, uh, sorry, the, the GTE unit, the Geometry Transformation Engine, um, was used to offload expensive computational tasks, um, so uh, used in 3D to, a, to the separate chip. So it's a separate coprocessor. Uh, this is hardware acceleration, right? So, so the CPU can continue doing, running the software, 
doing the logic of the game whilst letting all the 3D transformations and all the work happen on a separate chip. Um, interesting enough, it used fixed point math. So um, that the, we had no pesky floating point math here. Um, the, even the processor didn't have, it had support for one, but they never added one. Um, and this also means that the PlayStation has some interesting 3D quirks. If you've ever played it, or you're going to go back and play after this talk, you'll kind of start realizing that there's some, some jiggery happening on, not just on the textures, but also on the geometry. And that's caused by the fixed point uh, math. Certainly also by the, the way the developer ranged their fixed point. I won't go into that right now. Right. Uh, then we've got the motion decoder unit. So it's also called the macro, a macro block decoder. Um, uh, that is actually used. It, the macro blocks, the macro data structure is very similar to JPEG. So uh, it uses discrete cosine transformations uh, on a YUV color space. That's a brightness and then uh, red to green, green to blue uh, space. Um, it basically meant that with less information, it's very, it's very similar. The reason why we still use that today, right? So this is very similar J to JPEG, MPEG-1, and MPEG-2, OK? Um, each of the blocks, the macro blocks, are 8 by 8 cells of 24 bits each. They can be 16 bit as well. And in fact, the game, Resident Evil game, uses 16 bit version of these. Um, and the throughput, which is kind of interesting about this, the throughput can do 9,000 macro blocks a second. Uh, that means that the original PlayStation can stream full screen, 320 by 240, full motion video at 30 FPS, um, which is really impressive for its day. I mean, this is the quintessential 32-bit. Like, like at the time, before this, 16-bit was the popular thing. 2D, fast, you know, scrolling platformers and stuff. 3D was just a massive thing. And to get full motion video, that was just phenomenal. Um, so the GPU. Uh, the GPU uh, is obviously rendering for, uh, re rendering polygons, lines, and so on for 3D graphics. Um, uh, all rotated scale 2D graphics. I'll, I'll go into that a bit. Um, and it's, it also uses two 16-bit uh, data buses. Uh, and so the graphic, mo graphic modes like Resident Evil 1, I've obviously done a lot of research. Again, it's clear when you're trying to work on something like this, do your research. Um, it has six, it, it, if you use 16 bits per pixel, then you get the most throughput from the graphics. Um, and then all three of these chips, if you look on the diagram, is connected to the uh, bus interface unit, uh, which is also connected to a DMA controller. And basically, this allows the CPU to, again, continue doing its computation. DMA stands for direct memory access. And basically, it allows the, the, um, the for example, the motion decoder to deliver its result directly to the GPU and therefore to the video memory. OK, so it basically allows us to offload tasks, again, freeing up the G CPU to do the game, to run the game logic. Before this kind of thing, before DMA, you would have, um, it, you worked on TVs, I'm not going to do it, but basically when it draw the pixels to the screen, you'd have a little bit of time, extra time, it's called overscan, and it would give you just enough time to run your game code. Um, so, you know, <laughs> what can I say? Um, uh, anyway, anyway, and uh, all of this information um, and this diagram came from uh, Rodrigo uh, Copti. I can't probably not pronounce his name right. And he did a wonderful job breaking this all down. And there's a link at the bottom there. It will, it will be in the slides afterwards uh, and in the description of the YouTube video when it's published. And you can go read up more about this. And it's really interesting, very helpful. Part two. I'm trying to get through this. I'm trying to get through this. Uh, eight minutes. Right. Okay, I've got to speed up. So, um, Origin, uh, original uh, PlayStation 1 game. We're going to play this just so you can see what we're talking about because you get a good perspective then. So let's see if this works. Uh, hopefully, we're going to see this. Fingers crossed, everyone. Aha, good. Whoops. So I don't know if any of you remember this. 
This is the typical. I'm hoping you can hear the sound coming back through my speakers. So apologies if there's echoing or anything terrible like that. So I've got a controller. We're going to load the game up. Um, I own an original copy of this, and I have a PlayStation 2 to play it on. So we're actually going to show this in a minute. This is an original graphic from the game, and you have these two cards. Uh, interesting enough, they have the same left part of the graphic. That'll be key to a little bit of explanation in, in a bit. So kind of keep an eye on that. We'll play it as Chris. I'm going to skip. I will just show the beginning of the full motion video as what we're talking about used by the motion codec. But I'm going to skip it because we don't need to know the background. So this is a full motion video. This is decoded 8 by 8 graphic cells called Macroblocks. And it's been directly dumped to the graphics card. Uh, I'm going to skip it from this point. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll show you this font, actually. Um, so it's the same pixel data with different palettes to do from colors. It's quite interesting. Anyway. So uh, this is the original game. Um, I'll, whilst this I is going, what I'm going to turn it down a bit. Whilst this is happening, I'll just tell you that the word is always quite funny uh, uh, as a kid because the acting was terrible. And it's because it's originally made by a Japanese Sony in Japan, and they had it dubbed, and they didn't know how bad it was. <laughs> so they would have had it done the timing, having better sort of use, but they were, this was Sony's first foray into the sort of English market for games, of games at all, and then into the English market. So I'll forgive them the bad acting. Yes. So interestingly, what you're seeing here, yeah. and what amazed me at the time, was all these lovely backgrounds. Now, what you're actually seeing here, and I'll talk about this in just a second when he comes into the room. Um, I'll talk a bit more about these doors. There's actually a point to these doors, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so here we are. We're in the game. This is the first time you get control of a character. And as you can see, it can move around in 3D. Now, what's interesting here is what you're seeing is a 2D picture with a 3D render on top. Okay? Try and help that into your mind. So the entire background here is not three-dimensional, right? The entire game scene is 2D, and the only 3D thing here is the main character. Then what happens is um, there's some information in the room. That's the room data of the game, which defines the perspective of the camera, the direction of the camera, the perspective of the floor, where the walls are. And then that information allows the game to know if I hit a wall or, or a column i have to i get go I, I get pushed around it but he's in front right now and then if we move behind we're like hang on a minute this is 2d how are we getting the 3d going behind like this what's actually happening here is there's a 2d sprite of the column painted on top <laughs> to to hide the player essentially so it's still 2d uh, and it's all a trick so it's all an illusion and most games are like this. Most games have the game here, the same here. The, the table and, and in this case, the chairs are all 2D sprites rendered in uh, on top with transparency, basically. And uh, if we see here, the camera change when I walk between areas, the game actually lays out areas on the floor, which are called uh, camera switches or regions, camera zones. I won't go into the differences right now. And then that, what that does is... It means that when you walk into a certain area, so it knows in, in in space, we'll go into this in a bit, in space where the character is, and when it moves into that, collides with that area, moves into that area, it will change the camera to the one specified in the zone. So this allows us to walk around changing camera viewpoint. So I'll, I'll carry on because I want to I want to get through a, a, a couple more little things. Um, it's very hard to tell, and there's a little twinkle on this clock, it's because this clock is a 3D model painted on top of the 2D backgrounds because it moves. So obviously with 2D backgrounds, you can't alter them. They're just fixed. So anything in the game that's 3D needs to move is on top. Now, this is really hard to tell in the original game. I can tell you right now, you could never tell. That's why the little sparkle was there. Now, in this emulator, we're going to whack it up to 4K. And now this, what this is doing is rendering all the 3D objects in 4K. Now, if you look here, the main character is in a higher resolution. This is because it's vectors, right? We don't, we, so, so it's painted, the, the original background is 2D. Now you can tell it's 2D because it's a different resolution to the foreground. So this is kind of revealing the tricks of the game. 
So we're going to carry on here. I'm going to leave in the high resolution just, just, just for the hell of it right now. And I want to explain. So we move up to a door. There's an area in front of the door again. So when if I press the action button, the game knows I'm in front of this door and to transition, transition the player to the next room. The transition here, the doors, are actually used because of that CD-ROM load time to load the next data for the next area. It gives the it gives the PlayStation just enough time to load all load and decode all of the backgrounds for the next area and load any objects and such like. So we're going to stop this in a minute here. I just want to show you the scariest bit of the original game was this full motion graphic of a zombie chewing a chewing a corpse. Uh oh, we're in trouble. So this is when you really sort of start feeling that 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 the game here. And I I'm gonna just try and defend myself here if I can remember the buttons. Oh no, no, I missed him. Now I'm if I'm not careful, I would die. But anyway, we're not playing the game. We're gonna um I'm afraid <laughs> you can go play. If you have the game yourself, go purchase the game and you can play it. Um, so um, I'm just going to go through, see if we can get up. I just want to just explain this little concept here. It, we have a little bit more time on this. And then I've got a lot to get through. So, um, oh no, the others have disappeared. What do I do? I'm on my own, obviously. Blah, blah. Come on. Someone just dropped a gun. That was like three pixels in the original game. Now you can tell it's actually a 3D gun model. <laughs> so um, I'm not gonna, yeah, I'll, I'll grab it. So as you can see, so interesting enough, this might seem higher resolution, this screen, um, not, the, not just the 3D model, but the actual uh, pixel data for the screen. And that's probably because the gra it was quite often for games to switch graphics mode. That is like 320 by 240 to 512 by 400 or something. Anyway, let's, uh, I'll, I'll shut up now and just carry on here. Um, I'll see if I can just show something off here. Again, as loading the next bit. Obviously, this was also used not necessarily for loading, but just for transitions, right? So there's a few times here where that, oh, we don't need to. So the character walks up the stairs. Um, I'm going to quickly die. So this is the top of the other room. Um, so there's a key point here, and that is it to the game. This, I'm not going to deal with the zombie now. Um, this, let me pause it. Can I pause it? Uh, no, not without dying, probably. Oh, no, let's die. Let's die. So this is, the, this is to be clear, that room... It looks like the same room to us, but to the game, it's a completely different room. It's just that it looks like a different level because it's rendered that way, but it's still just a flat room, just looks like it's up higher, right? To the 2D graphics. So just to, just to clarify that point. Anyway, oh, I went outside. I didn't mean to do that. Oh, come on. Right, come on. I'm going to die, and then we can get on. Hopefully I haven't spent too long too long on this to get through the rest of the slides. Right, let's die. Okay, so in the uh go on. There we go. So it fades out to white. I just want to show you this because it's kind of interesting. Fades out to white. And then you see this pattern is like a glowing pattern from the from the outside edge, and then you see you died on top, wavy, wavy like that. Okay, well, that will make sense in a bit. So that's it. It resets. We're dead. Uh, there's save points. There's other things. We're not going to go into the actual game. That's enough for now. So hopefully that was fun for everyone. Let's get back to the slides. If I can find the slides, there is. There we go. So now you know what we're dealing with, right? So rendering in 3D. So I need to explain to you the basics of 3D because, uh, I mean, we did kind of cover it. Uh, whoops. We did kind of cover it in the previous a little bit. 
uh, in the previous talk, um, but I want to cover it in a bit more detail. Also, explain what the GPU does and what uh, projections are. So um, let's see if I can sort of, I'm going to take myself off the screen here just so you guys get the full slides because I think I might have covered every bit of area of the screen. So 3D basics. So we, we talk, you might have heard the term vectors or vertices and both are pretty much interchangeable. Um, a group of vectors are vertices or sometimes an individual vector is also called a vertex. Um, they used to define meshes um, and directions and all sort of calculations in 3D, um, which makes them kind of essential to understand. So I kind of want to explain, <clears throat> sorry, this group, uh, this uh, this graph. So a vector is a line between two points. A vector also has a length, which is known as its magnitude, as shown here. So this um, has a this is a vector of nine comma six or nine uh, nine x six y. Um, so uh, it's also from always from an origin, uh, not always from an origin point, but in this case, it's from an origin point of zero, zero. So with a 2D vector, you can represent any point on a 2D plane. This is literally how we position the widgets on Flutter and, and all the kind of standard, standard stuff that we know of. OK, um, that's the same with most you know, 2D systems, right? They, they all use uh, uh, these kind of positions, right? Uh, key point. Flutter and other platforms that are normally GUI platforms set the origin at the top left. Whereas it's common for 3D, specifically OpenGL and others, to have the origin point at the bottom left. So just in case you're trying this yourself, you might wonder why things aren't positioned right. And it might be that you've got your coordinate mixed up for your origin. So 3D vectors, they work exactly the same as 2D vectors, what we just spoke about. They have an X and a Y that represent uh, a plane, and Y is always y is the up direction, except we've added another dimension, and that's the Z dimension. So if you've ever wanted to try and like kind of get this in your head, we work with the left hand, we're going to work with the left hand rule, and that's what if you hold your hand up in front of you, or, you know, and have your... Um, Index finger, point, index, finger point, index finger pointing upwards and your thumb pointing out to perform this L shape. That tells you you're playing. And then if you use your middle finger and point it away from you, your thumb is going to represent the X, your middle, your index finger the Y, and your and your middle finger the Z. This also gives you the order X, Y, Z, right? Um, so now if you consider the model on the right in the image, each of the yellow dots represents a vertex or vector uh, and all together, these are called vertices. And the verte uh, and the, the, each vector is going to have an x, y, z value from the origin point of the model. And that's like the center point. Now, again, the center, the, the origin does not have to be inside the model. It can, can be completely a different place altogether, right? It's just where you define those coordinates from, giving them a, a anchor point. So... <clears throat> As I was saying, um, each one is a uh, a vertex. Uh, each one is is a three dimensional point. And to draw these three dimensional points, we need to know uh, we need to define a face that is, in this case, a triangle. So we link three edges together, and as you can see here, we've got the vertex edges turned to faces, which are triangles, and then conceptually we join them together into polygons and surfaces to form our last three D shapes. Um, and just to be clear, this is exactly what the PlayStation GPU and the Flutter do. They, they literally draw triangles and they are 2D triangles. Even the PlayStation, all the 3D you just saw were 2D triangles. We'll talk a bit more about that. So um, the data in meshes um, is represented by, is normally represented by a list of indexes or indices at three per face. So as you can see here on the face list, there's uh, three vector indexes, so V0, 4, 5, represent what one of the vectors from the list on the right, the vertex list, is going to be used for that triangle. Um, they're also presented, in, in, in this case, 0, 4, 5, um, in a, uh, sorry, also in the, in the picture on the right, 0, 1, 2, um, 
in a clockwise fashion. And this is so that the triangle is facing towards the camera. If the if they were drawn in a counterclockwise rotation, they'd be facing away from the camera. Now that does depend on the rendering system you're using, so, so on and such like, um, but you'll probably see the terms CW and CCW used around the internet, which stands for clockwise and counterclockwise. Um, so just kind of give you some basics here. Um, the data uh, represented on those tables actually for this cube, which has its, which also has two center points at the top and bottom. So it actually has uh, 10 uh, vertices here in the table, and that accounts for 16 faces. So 16 triangles that make up the, the total. Um, I should have had credit here, thanks to Wikipedia for the picture. Um, right. Um, slides aren't changing. Uh, okay. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, now it's working again now. All right. Okay. Uh, we're going to continue on hopefully i haven't missed any slides apologies so uh section three uh, yeah no we're still on section three okay rendering <laughs> I'm trying to check my time what does the gpu do so to be clear and this is one of those things that is really um really confusing for some and that is what you see in front of you right now with my face on it and the and the and the presentation that is a bitmap in the GPU, it is a flat bitmap, just like a picture that you would download from the internet, right? It's a series of an XY plane of pixels. And each pixel is represented by a red, green, blue value. And with those, as you can see here with the primary colors, you can represent all the colors of the rainbow. We won't go into what that is right now. Um, most of these are 32 bit, which also means they include an alpha. Uh, that's mainly for textures so that you can alpha between different layers. However, in a, in a case of a frame buffer, there is no transparency to your monitor, so alpha is ignored. Normally, it's twenty; it can be twenty-four bit, so you, you um, exclude the alpha channel. Sometimes it's thirty-two bit, and it's called RGBX. X being excluded, ignored. It just skips a byte, and that can actually be more performant, skipping thirty-two bits at a time, rather than trying to do twenty-four bits for for one pixel, twenty-four bits for the next, because they they cross boundaries, thirty-two bit boundaries. Another problem entirely, won't go there. So um, both the PlayStation, yeah, 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 to be clear, both the PlayStation and Flutter only render 2D polygons, right? Moving on. So uh, on the PlayStation, uh, it relies on the, uh, the geometry transformation engine, the coprocessor, to perform the vertex transformations. Um, that is like the movement of those, the, the computational change of those three dimensional points. We'll go into that in more, in just a second. Um, but in modern 3D hardware, that's done in uh, in your 3D graphics accelerator, your graphics card, and that's done in this pipeline that you see here on the screen. So this is the Flutter. This is essentially the same as the Flutter pipeline from the GPU that would be used on your graphics uh, on your graphics chip in your phone, and also the one on uh, your computer that you're seeing hopefully me on. Um, However, in the case of the PlayStation, it has a different pipeline. I'm not going to represent that because we're not talking about the old system. We're trying to talk about Flutter. So, and as you can see here, there's two bolded concepts, a vertex shader and a fragment shader. Shaders, you might have heard of this concept. These are the things, these are computational bits of scripting that run on the graphics card, on the GPU itself. And a vertex shader moves vertexes around, and then it then gets rendered into the, or rasterized into its pixels in, into fragments right and those fragments are processed through a fragment shader each pixel is run through the fragment shader and then it's tested for blending and then written to the frame buffer which again is just pixels on the pixels once the frame buffer is complete um that is sent out to the monitor or to the television that's as simply as it works um I did mention this just quickly. I just want to say that, yeah, each triangle is scanned line by line into a series of pixels into the frame buffer, right? And the color values are retrieved from the texture using uh, UV coordinates is one thing from it, also called texture coordinates in Flutter. So we're getting, getting close. So much to talk about. Right, I'm going to try and get through this. Right, um, projection. Projecting your 3D world. 
So projection is literally where 3D ends and 2D begins. And it sounds counterintuitive, but um, you're basically, the, the idea is to use a matrix, use matrix math to flatten or project your 3D coordinates, that is your entire world or your scene, in onto a 2D plane. That is how you get the position of where it should be on your screen. That's as simple as it gets. So the GTE, that's the graphics transformation engine, is the thing in the PlayStation that did that. Um, however, and on in uh, Flutterland, we do that in dark code using a, a library I'll talk about later on, <clears throat> if we get there. Um, I'm trying to spot, fasten this up. Um, and then, yeah, once all those triangles are flattened, we use their original Z coordinates to determine the painting order. Um, and we use a painter's algorithm. Uh, you can go look this up, it's called painter's algorithm, which is basically just drawing the, the, the furthest things away first during, during the, the things that are then closer afterwards. So you're drawing from back to front. Um, uh, there is also a system where we don't want to render triangles that are facing away from the camera, so we don't waste time painting them because they're never seen. Uh, that's called backface culling. And there's there's also uh, rotation, quaternions, and the relation to gimbal lock. There's so much to talk about in 3D. I just want to cover these basics, right? Um, and hopefully the idea is that this is all done by my library for you. So how does this all help us? with in, in you know in flutter making 3d games okay so luckily luckily the dart team google have made a library called vector math and that supports 2d 3d and 4d vectors and matrix types um so two-dimensional as we talked about x and y three-dimensional x y and z four-dimensional is x y z and w i'm not going to cover that right now it is used in computing 3D, 3D graphics. Um, this also can be used for colors. So as we said earlier, a, ve a vector three is three values. Well, there you go, red, green, and blue. And then if you have alpha, well, then you've got four values. So it's red, green, blue, alpha. That's a 4D vector. Um, and then quaternions are used for rotating. Um, you can rotate using si sine and cosine, but then there's a point at which they cross and it's called gimbal lock. And then you'll get like a weird rotation happen. You might see see this in games. Um, oh, I've been extended for 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so um, uh, so all of this and collision detection, all this other fun thing has been done for me and for you by the Flutter team. So thank you very much. This is all by Dart and Google. This is also used in Flutter. However, you do need to specify it as a direct dependency, not a transitive dependency. Um, and that's just good programming. Um, and then on the canvas, so the standard canvas, you know, you can use a custom painter. In fact, that's what I use in my examples. Um, you can also use custom render objects, another topic. I'm sure there's other talks on that. Um, and you can call this function, it's called draw vertices. And basically what we're doing is, as you can see on the right, the vertices is an object which holds a set of positions in offsets now is x and y the 2d coordinates that's the 2d triangles and that list contains in order uh well actually so it can be unordered uh, all those vertexes that have been projected to the 2d surface and then we also contain uh the texture coordinates again ordered exactly the same as the positions and the colors of each one of those points ordered exactly the same um we also have a list of indices. I, I, we, as I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you remember that, but the indices are the indexes into those lists above. So if we specify an index of 0, 1, 2, we expect to have a triangle in clockwise rotation inside the positions buffer of, uh, of three values of x y, uh, x, y coordinates for each one, and then the texture coordinates for each one. Um, however, again, as it says here, they can be nullable, so you don't have to specify the texture coordinates or the colors, and you can just render the positions. Now, as a, on the left hand side, you'll notice that it says there's a blend mode and paint. That is what's used to render all of the triangles, all of the triangles on the screen. Um, the paint can also have what's called an image shader, and that's how you specify the texture. Um, again, don't you don't have to concern yourself with this? I want to explain how it works so you know, but again. The, the code that I'm going to be releasing later on in the week will will have this all in place for you. 
Um, and I want to be clear, I am not the first to, to do use these functions and there's plenty of others before me. Um, I kind of wanted to, to cover, and I didn't get a chance to do a slide for this, some notable uh, names that I remember. Um, there was uh, what's called, if I find it, um, Sunset Reflections Clock. I can't remember his name. I was going to put it on the slide. So I'll, if I get time, I'll go bring it up. But um, a long, long time ago, before the Flutter Clock Challenge, I was actually using the draw vertices with some of the others in the community to fiddle around with 3D and wireframes and things, never doing anything major. Then uh, in the Flutter Clock Challenge, when I was looking at all the entries, someone did a Sunset Reflections Clock. It looks, and I'll be obvious, I'm just going to be frank about this, it looks unimpressive because you see it and it's just some pictures. It looks like an image. But what the what the um, chap, I forget his name, uh, was doing was actually doing this, projecting and rendering 3D to make his clock up. And he actually did the calculations for lighting and all sorts. So it's very, very impressive. And then further than that, uh, G Skinner, um, that is... Uh, She's going to did a, I think it was called, one of its Flutter vignettes. I forget the name of it. Um, they did one that also had contains some 3D uh, using the same exactly the same techniques as well. So moving on. Okay. So we talk about, we've talked about graphics and we talked about the graphics pipeline. Well, uh, what is a game engine then, right? Like that's what the GPU does. What is a game engine? So um, I... <laughs> I haven't got any slides on this, but I will walk through this uh, in the, in a demo, hopefully. Uh, can I take you? Oh, actually, I'll leave it to the end. So if I've got time, we can go through it. But in, in, I'll just walk you through this now. Um, so in most game engines, I mean, we'll just talk Unreal, Unity, and my one, which is called Zombie, um, uh, contain a concept of a scene, which has a set of entities uh, or game objects. These have a transformation attached and that is a position in 3d space a rotation and a scale and then you have cameras which essentially are the same thing an entity in the scene but they also contain information about the projection that is how you're going to render the graphics um i will show you we'll, we'll get to some demo stuff i'll show you some code in a minute so uh reverse engineering resident evil one so Again, the original concept was the original game, understanding that technique of 2D, 3D, and going, well, I have the ability to, 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 do, to, to, to render these polygons. I have the ability to draw these backgrounds. Why don't we try and recreate Resident Evil 1 as a great example for, for the engine? That includes reverse engineering. So this took more time than I care to admit, um, and I did a lot of research. I stepped on the shoulders of others here, and completely went online, saw other people doing, a lot of it was Resident Evil 2, there's not much on Resident Evil 1, and what there is on Resident Evil 1 no longer exists online, a lot of it is in the Wayback Machine, so it's pretty tough. Anyway, I've, I think I found some new concepts that weren't in any of the reverse engineering documents that I found. So um, I wanted to show you some of the images that I've extracted from the grain. Um, so as you, I don't know if you remember from the demo, but we had that Resident Evil title. So it had a video in the background, the title came out, and then a red Resident Evil zoomed out from the camera to the to into the scene uh, in the same position. And that is the graphic you see there. They just colorize it red. Um, you also, when we noticed when we picked the, the, the game card, we actually saw that we actually see these game cards on the right. Now, interestingly, what we've got here is actually the same graphics data. It's palletized data. That means it's it's an index per pixel with a palette, and the palettes are 16 colors. And what it does is it's use, it uses 16 colors for one section of the image and another 16 colors for another section, another 16 colors for a further section. This means we're actually using 48 color palette for one image. Now, the PlayStation only supported 16 or 256. So by using three 16s, they could reduce the overall um, data storage, so they could load it quicker, and also um, the, the usage of the GPU frame buffer for storing the pallets. The actual pallets, by the way, are stored in the frame buffer just off screen. Um, and then on the left-hand side here, you'll see there's an image that says you died, and that's what happened when we died. And then underneath that is a, is a square there with a pattern. That is actually the, 
the background that fades in and fades out when you die. But what's interesting is only one quarter because they would, again, store only a quarter in graphics memory. And then they would draw it in, in two triangles in a quad and flip it around in the four section, four quadrants of the screen so they could save memory. And these are all techniques that are commonly common practice in lots of games. And then in the middle of the bottom here, we see the game map. I didn't go into, I didn't get the pick up the map, so you never saw this. But um, there's a game map and it highlights the different rooms. And as you, that, that center bottom one is the main stairs, the main room, and then uh, so on. And then the, the blue bit here is actually a bit of unused sprite data. And that's how they represented it when they were lining up the graphics in the eight by eight cells. So here we are to demo time. So recreating Resident Evil 1 in Flutter. So let's see how far we can get with this. Let's close the original. Now, um, I've got, this is, see what code we have here. So um, uh, some, some of the community might recognize this. I want to use this for demonstration purposes. Um, and I started doing this 3D stuff all oh, a long, long time ago, doing some Pac-Man stuff. I won't go into that now. But what you see here on the left is a rendering of a 3D model from the game. And it is done in Flutter. And you can see some, some Flutter code here um, where we do some matrices and then it draws vertices. You know, there's no, there's no magic here. But what we want to do is if I turn on a line here and hot restart or hot reload, there you go. Now you see it rotating. Now it looks 3D. And when I say looks 3D, it's because that's it. What you're seeing is 2D triangles. And it's also the reason why, if you look around the shoulders, you'll see it kind of glitches a little bit. That's called uh, Z fighting. And it's because the two, the, the, the Z index, the, the centroid, that is the center of a triangle, where we calculate the depth, is the same place for the two triangles, even though one is in front of the other. This is actually solved in modern graphics hardware by what's called a Z buffer. And Flutter doesn't give us a Z buffer. Hopefully, um, we can do proper 3D in the future in Flutter. Uh, there are this again. This is all rendered with Flutter's dark and, and the Dart language. There is options around Flutter that other people in the community um, are experimenting with, and that is bringing the full 3D pipeline of like OpenGL or something to Flutter. And in doing that, that actually gives you a texture. That's a two-dimensional viewport into your 3D. But this is truly 3D in Flutter, if you will. Um, so, and I'm going to turn on another rotation, and this is going to hopefully blow your mind because uh, if I now rotate the projection, yeah, this is what you see. So what you're seeing is a 2D plane of the 3D graphic rotating. It's not, it's what it's not doing, it's not scaling, it's not squishing, right? You're seeing the perspective of, a th like my hand here, you're seeing it, go around like this right and that just shows you that it's actually 2d triangles right we're projecting 2d triangles but we're rotating the surface that we're projecting onto okay so okay that's enough of demo one hopefully uh we can explore a little bit so um i'm gonna hopefully run another demo here and i maybe i have broken it um we'll find out won't we <laughs> um i think that's going to start in the wrong place but we'll find out um come on come on whilst that's building um i'll just show you so i actually wrote um a, the discrete cosine transformation stuff for the backgrounds of the game so I'll minimize that for a second so what i'm going to show you here hopefully if i can make the view larger these are all of the backgrounds that i decoded from the original game raw data files and this is exactly what the game would do so um there's actually some i didn't get to show um some of the uh uh work that i did extracting so i'm going to quickly just show you guys um i did show this on the hub day q a but but whilst i was writing this decoder this is the kind of thing that you start with, right? Not code is never ever like just magically finished the first time you do it, right? Like it, you know, it it it, it takes some effort. And time it gets still in my focus. Anyway, so here you'll see um, 
again, the eight by eight block cells, you can definitely see them in here. And me definitely, the X, by the way, is my debugging. And uh, me definitely not getting the colors right. And eventually going, okay, well, there's one UV plane. There's another UV plane, highly compressed. Maybe I could work on my compressor a bit more. Trying to merge them together, slowly getting there. And then realizing, oh, I've got my pixel rendering out of order for each 8 by 8 cell because it looks like crap. <laughs> then sort of doing that in black and white, just so I get rid of the color from it so I can understand what's going wrong eventually ending up with what I shared on Twitter not too long ago, which is this image. And this is the final. Um, if I can zoom in a bit, if I can find a good place. Uh, I did want to also mention that other people, and again, other people have done this. You can upscale them. So if we look at, if we compare this, that, this is the original graphic, right? If you look at the pixels on the door and we look at the light. Now, if we upscale that using AI, we kind of get this. So hopefully that'll be what we end with. So we get like an even better graphical version of the game. Um, let's let's jump back over to these. So yeah, so as you saw, that was this top left one. Um, and if we zoom in, my decoder is not finished. So if you look over here on the right, you'll see some colors off. And let's say around the door here, hopefully this comes through, you'll see like there's blocks of color that are off by the door, right? And it's still, still work in progress, but looks pretty good. And I'm happy with it for the time being. So, yeah, what we've got here is all those things, including the game scenes that we saw earlier, including this one. So we now take these scenes and we can draw them in Flutter, which means we end up with some things like I'm going to show you now. So I'm going to hopefully show this off a bit. So... What you're, if I, re, I'm going to restart this. So this is camp. Hopefully, that's not right. Uh, okay, that's camera zero. Right now, what I've done here is I take an original two D background, painted it in Flutter, and then we have a two dimensional. Um, uh, we have two-dimensional data about the collision. That is the areas of the floor that you can't walk into as a player. And I'm projecting them upwards. And it's actually extruding those shapes upwards. They have floor heights. I won't go into that right now. And that's how we kind of see in this three-dimensional view. But if I now change to a different camera in the scene, there's a different viewport of the same thing. Next camera in the scene. These are all the original camera viewpoints of the game. Yeah. Uh, Zero, sorry, is this one. That's the starting. Sorry, I got the numbers wrong there. Zero, that's the starting one. So you can see there, looking down. Uh, and then we have three, four, five. And I think there's a sixth one. Yeah, so these are all what you saw earlier. Now, again, if I now move the camera, there's the 3D scene, right? So I'll show you this more out off in a minute, but just to show you that it is 3D, that's actually happening. Um, uh, it's also, I'm, I'm demonstrating this with vector colors for the for the things and the points. This is all debugging right now, and I can just turn them off, right? They're not, they're not required to be there. And we can texture all these surfaces, no problem. Again, there's no need in this game to texture them. Um, I'm going to use this for debugging when I get the player in there. I'm afraid I didn't get there in time for the talk. Um, but we're gonna show, I'm gonna show you some of the stuff with the player as well. So um, let's see how far we can go with this. Um, do I have, do I have time? Let me, let me see if I can switch here. Um, nope, nope. We're gonna see if we can actively switch this and see what happens. I'll also show you another room in a minute. So here is here's another demonstration. And this is me putting multiple objects in my scene, including, in this case, rendered objects. And this is me moving around with the camera. So I can, I can move around. I can project. We're seeing all the things from the scene. That kind of makes sense. So um, I've got a couple of bugs that I know exactly how to fix. There's no time to fix them. And that is 
when uh, certain triangles go behind the camera, sometimes they're pre that some of the debug vertices, only the debug ones are projected incorrectly. And then interestingly, there's a bug in Flutter, which I haven't filed yet, which is when there's no more triangles, we end up painting all of the triangles, no more triangles in the, in the index list. There's, it treats a blank list the same as null. And in doing so, um, it tries to paint all of the triangles. And in this case, they're all reversed because they're behind the camera. I won't go into the, the matrix stuff right now. So if I come back out, so this is again, it's working, right? And I can fix that myself by repacking the vertices. Um, I also have these rendered, you know, they all will work nice and nice and speedily. Um, that was it. I'm, I want to cut. So can I just bring up one slide, one slide, and then I'll let everyone's, let everyone go Fine. because this is, this was the entire purpose of this was to, to was to, um, um, hopefully show this. So Flutter now has a thing called fragment program, which is a fragment shader, which lets you do all sorts of fancy effects and will also project us onwards with 3D a bit further. I won't go into that right now. However, this does exist. It's a class in Flutter. You can use it. Um, there's new features in Master on this, and it's actively being worked on. And in fact, the one of the creators of Flame, Jochen, uh, has made this article very recently. In fact, it was published yesterday, um, uh, and he's tweeted it. And I'll, I'll, again, post this link in the chat in just a minute. And that also talks about using these new shaders to do fancy three, uh, fancy uh, textured things. Anyway, that was it. That was the last thing. So the future of Flutter is looking good.